In our world, there exists an individual with supernatural powers that have the remarkable ability to transform the impossible into reality. That person is Seiki, who just saved a dog from an oncoming car. 16 years ago, an ordinary family joyfully welcomed a child who was anything but ordinary. By the age of 14 days, the child demonstrated the ability to communicate without vocalizing. Additionally, by one month old, the child displayed the remarkable ability to move in a walking motion, albeit in mid-air. At just one year old, it willingly accompanied its mother on a shopping trip, demonstrating its helpful nature within seconds. Nevertheless, the child continued to feel as though he were the most unfortunate individual on the planet. Seiki possessed the extraordinary ability to accomplish anything, yet he couldn't find any joy in his achievements or be genuinely surprised by unexpected events. When the father arrived home, he asked the child to pick the lock because they didn't have the key. Afterwards, he placed the blame on the mother, accusing her of changing the lock. It appears that there is a significant amount of tension between this married couple, as they frequently engage in arguments and question each other's love. In the evening, the entire family enjoyed a delicious dinner of pork ribs, while the father opted for a plate of ribs made from working shoes. The father attempted to voice his complaint loudly, which led to him receiving an additional shoe as a bonus from another pair. He then asked his son to turn his shoe into a steak, but the child did not comply with his father's request. The father had to finish his meal, but the smell was unpleasant. He was required to lick his boss's shoes while at work, and now he finds himself having to lick his own shoes at home. The mother gently held Seiki's hand and expressed that his ability should be used solely to assist those in desperate situations. This made Seiki perceive his mother as a kind-hearted individual, but he soon realized that this was not the case. She immediately suggested that he create a hammer in order to smash his father's head. This is an example of how peaceful an evening can be for a family. The dinner was a success. The father attempted to eat Seiki's portion of the ribs while he was about to enjoy his dessert. However, the mother intervened by lifting the entire dining table and hurling it directly at him. Thanks to Seiki's ability, the table was fortunately held in midair. However, instead of using his superpower to bring peace to his home and allow himself to relax and enjoy his dessert, he chose not to. The mother took his food abruptly and offered it to the father as a way to make amends, resulting in another evening filled with chaos. Seiki is a student at PK Academy, and today is the school's open day. When reminiscing about preschool, it was clear that Seiki had an unbeatable advantage in the game of rock-paper-scissors due to his ability to read people's minds. Despite the teacher's attempts to defeat him, he emerged victorious a hundred times in a row, completely overpowering her. The teacher was extremely angry and had the urge to throw a surprise punch at Seiki, but she refrained from doing so. Following the incident, the teacher in question was no longer seen at the school, causing a significant shift in focus towards Seiki by many individuals. So he had to learn how to hide his abilities from others. However, there is one individual at school who Seiki cannot influence with his powers, Ricky. Seiki couldn't read Ricky's thoughts since there were none in his mind. Ricky attempts CPR on a student who falls unconscious during the ceremony. It's as though he wants to kill the individual rather than save him. Not only that, but he also gives that student rescue breaths. When the student is taken to the hospital, he rushes to the sink and vomits. His first kiss went to a boy. Ricky claims he feels the same way. At that point, a teacher overhears their talk and discovers that the student lied about his illness, prompting him to investigate him. However, the boy blamed Seiki and Ricky, and Ricky later claimed that he was suffering from a virus-related ailment that caused a high fever. The teacher instantly took that student's temperature and discovered it was 92 degrees Celsius, so he summoned emergency medical assistance. Seiki used magic to conjure fire and accidentally burned the thermometer, but Ricky felt Seiki had contracted that fictitious ailment as well. As a result, Seiki was taken to the hospital. People who do not think with their brains are extremely hazardous. Another character appears. Shun is a man suffering from delusional condition. He keeps telling his pals about an evil secret society made up of snakes, centipedes, or anything, but no one listens. So, embarrassed, he goes outside and enters the restroom. When Seiki sees all of this, he immediately conjures a snake in the classroom, exactly as Shun indicated, and lets it run free with the panicked pupils while he waits in the lavatory stall next to Shun's. Ricky mocks his classmates for being cowardly while the classroom becomes a shambles, but he faints when he finds the snake has bitten him in the crotch. Shun enters the classroom after a brief period of crying and confronts the serpent, striking poses and chanting nonsense. Meanwhile, Seiki is still in the lavatory, killing the snake with lightning, and the entire class believes Shun has abilities, while Shun himself becomes even more insane, 
believing he is the chosen one and even talks back to a teacher once everything is resolved. A new character has now appeared. Kakomi is her name, and she is really gorgeous and draws a lot of attention from everyone. When she spots Seiki on the street, she knows he's in her class, so she decides to approach him, primarily with the purpose of seducing him. Seiki, on the other hand, ignores her and reacts indifferently to her little display. She believes Seiki is simply too astonished and embarrassed to express his affections, so she repeatedly follows him and tries to touch him. But Seiki avoids her. When they arrive in a throne, Seiki observes Ricky walking in front of them. Ricky turns around directly back at him, just as he is hoping Ricky won't notice him so he won't have to recognize Kakomi. Seiki teleports without thinking after being shocked. Kakomi was astonished to discover that Seiki had vanished. She approaches Ricky and inquires whether he has seen Seiki, to which Ricky responds that he has not. She even begins to believe she is hallucinating and imagining Seiki. Kakomi imagines she fell in love with the pink-haired classmate, sticking to the idea of adoring someone so much that you could nearly see them everywhere you went. However, Seiki has been standing on the roof of a tall building for a long time, entirely uninterested in such delusions. During the next physical education lesson, the entire class will compete in a dodgeball match. In the dodgeball game, Seiki tries to intentionally get struck in the face, so he is eliminated. But his team captain, the class president, declares he is safe because of the face-safe rule. So he now has possession of the ball. Seiki has always struggled with modulating his strength when throwing dodgeballs, having previously broken an iron ball barrel. The leader encourages Seiki to throw it as he means it, but Seiki knows there will be casualties if he does. So Seiki throws it lightly and Ricky catches it. Then Ricky eliminates one by one each member of Seiki's squad until only Seiki and the class president remain. Ricky launches a hard throw at the class president, but Seiki catches it as he prepares to exit the court. But, instead, the class president catches the ball with all his strength, forcing him to tumble and his pants to fall, restoring hope to Seiki's team. If he flips the script, he will garner a lot of attention, but if he gives up, all of his comrades will curse him to death. So Seiki utilizes his power and discovers that the average favorability point is 42, implying that 50 points will assist him avoid drawing attention and will keep him from being a victim of bullying. As he eliminates the first guy, his score rises to 56. It's Shun's turn to hold the ball, he attempts to brag, then throws like a female. The entire class looks at Seiki as if he'll die if he doesn't catch this ball, so he has to catch it, and in doing so, he directly eliminates three other players on the opposite squad. Finally, when he decides to quit, the class president sacrifices his pants once more to preserve the squad. So they win, and Seiki receives an 82-point favorability score. It's too high, so he searches for a solution to lower it. But then Ricky appears and hugs him, bringing the affection score back down to 46. What a time saver. Everyone his age is looking for a romantic companion these days, and there is a lady in his class who likes Seiki. As a result, she begins to make arrangements to create a connection with him. She first hides in a hallway corner and pretends to run into him. But Seiki easily dodges and neatly organizes the paperwork she drops for her. All of her subsequent plans fail owing to Seiki's talents. The weather appears to be preparing to rain as they prepare to leave at the conclusion of the day. Seiki, who is untouched by her illusion, stops the rain. Then another boy approaches her and confesses to her, leading her to believe that her real love had arrived, despite the fact that she was desperately attempting to win over Seiki. The following chapter is about moving day and Seiki's father instructs him to utilize his powers to carry some of the items because he is too busy carrying his wife. Just as Seiki was about to move the bed, his clumsy father knocks it down on the ground. Not only that, but he tried to impress everyone by raising the bed with one hand, nearly killing himself. Seiki tried to shift the mattress, but it became stuck everywhere. One end became entangled on the balcony, another on the wardrobe, and yet another at the door. The solution is simple, he just breaks down the wall to make more room. He fixes the wall and leaves everything as it was after a full day of shifting. Seiki utilizes mind control to make everyone on Earth have distinct hair colors, blue, red, purple, and yellow, in order to avoid drawing too much notice, so his pink hair wouldn't be overly noticeable. He also alters the human body's ability to heal, allowing patients to recover faster. Consider Ricky, who has already grown back the teeth he lost when a baseball hit him in the face. Seiki's other hypothetical principles include the fact that torn clothing retains its integrity in key locations. That size no longer correlates with strength, 
and that one punch to the neck is enough to make a person unconscious. Even at the school gate, if a disruptive pupil raises a commotion, the teachers can just strike him in the neck and knock him out. Someone wrote a letter to Seiki in the following chapter, claiming to be aware of his abilities and wishing to become his disciple. Someone rang the doorbell just as Seiki was going to use his powers to find out who authored the letter. The unidentified writer's letter has just arrived in Seiki. Rita, a spiritual diplomat who can see and talk with spirits, introduces himself. He's had the talent since birth, and when he was younger, he couldn't tell the difference between ghosts and humans. But, because ghosts have no physical form, his grandmother advised him to try to touch them. He hugged her after taking her counsel, only to discover she was not human. Then Grandpa rushed to soothe him, but as he passed through his transparent body, he learned the harsh truth. Rita then continues to hug other individuals to see if they are ghosts or not, something he appears to be quite interested in when it comes to beautiful girls. Then he claims that there are 15 trapped souls in Seiki's chamber, with one of them rubbing their buttocks against Seiki's face. Following that, he wishes to be Seiki's student and hopes that he will accept him. But Seiki is thinking about what he said about an unseen bottom hanging in front of his face, and he tells him to leave swiftly using his powers. However, when Seiki accidentally touches Rita, he inherits Rita's spiritual psychic skills and discovers the entire room is filled with ghosts. The next morning in class, Seiki hears about a new student who can see guardian spirits, and he quickly recognizes him and takes Rita to the restroom, asking him to transfer to another school right now. Seiki then constructs a spiral-shaped sword out of toilet paper and threatens Rita, leading him to become terrified and remain silent about his power. A group of girls approaches Rita as they are about to return to class and inquires about their guardians. One is a warrior, another is a noble, and the third is a beggar. Rita informed the guys that they were all accompanied by old people, which enraged them. Shun boldly moves forward, assuming he has prehistoric creatures as protectors, but it turns out to be the spirit of a chihuahua. At that point, Ricky approaches Rita and inquires about his, but Rita utterly ignores him. Rita understands Ricky is a genuine person until while they are on their way home from school. He then takes Seiki to a temple and introduces him to his guardian spirit, who happens to be Ricky's father. Rita assumed Ricky was a ghost because he resembled his father so much. Seiki's parents must attend a wedding, therefore he must clean the house alone. He puts his clothes in the washing machine and goes to take out the trash, but he finds a cockroach and teleports to the other side of the earth, his legs still trembling. Despite his invulnerability, he cannot read the thoughts of little creatures to determine what they are thinking. As the doorbell rings, Seiki swiftly returns to his room and teleports through the first level, where the cockroach resides, to deliver a package for his mother. When he opens the door, he is welcomed by his friend, Ricky, rather than a delivery man. He flees again, afraid, but returns, requesting Ricky to catch the bug for him. Ricky smashes the cockroach right on the spot, just as he is going to tell Ricky to put them outdoors. That night, Seiki's mother returns and buys him a box of chocolates, but she loses part of them, causing Seiki to think of cockroaches and teleport to an island in the Republic of Palau. A new day starts, and Seiki goes to study as usual in class, but a female keeps looking at him compassionately. It's the girl from the beginning of the series who dated someone else after failing to communicate with Seiki. However, due to her boyfriend's terrible habits and vulnerabilities, it appears that she is becoming bored and wishes to quit the relationship. Seiki is concerned that if they break up, the girl will pursue him, so he assesses the issue in order to assist this pair love each other more. The girl has a 57 affection score for her lover, but it dips to 54 when he forgets it is their three-month anniversary. Seiki remembers and prepares a gift for her after using his psychic power on him, ordering her to close her eyes. He takes out a half-eaten dried squid packet that he plans to offer, but Seiki instantly transforms it into a cuddly rabbit. They then go to a claw machine game and win plush animals together, raising their affection score to 90. However, when they go to a restaurant in the evening, all of his red flags appear. He yells at the staff, the stink of his feet is free in the air, he uses chopsticks like an alien, and he has the habit of eating loudly, which causes the affection score to plunge. As the girl sobs her way out of the restaurant and breaks up with her clueless boyfriend, Seiki becomes increasingly concerned about his own future well-being. Seiki is shown traveling along the school corridor on his way home. He expects to come home with enough time to watch his favorite anime show, which will run at 5 p.m., one hour later. Seiki abruptly leaves because he detects something and wishes to escape Shun, who is hunting for him nearby. 
Shun discovered an abandoned house and wanted to invite Seiki there. But Seiki was uninterested in his new hiding place. Hero is already waiting for him at the top of the steps. He changed his course once more, but Kakomi is still looking for him. Seiki avoids them all, but he comes to a halt when Riki emerges out of nowhere and invites him to eat ramen. With nowhere else to go, Seiki chooses to hide in the restroom and use his powers to track down people who are hunting for him. He can't leave the school anymore since Haro is watching the door, Shun is at the lockers, and Kakomi is enlisting the help of all of her slaves to find him. Seiki has to resort to making himself invisible, but it only lasts 10 minutes and will fade if someone touches him. Seiki slips out of the bathroom stall quietly, heading to Shun's locker, and drops it, scaring him and causing him to scream, drawing the attention of Kakomi and Haro. It's time to flee, but he collides with Riida, revealing himself. In the end, no one knows if Seiki returned home or not, but one of the Kakomi slaves is still seeking for him even though the sun has set. We then focus on the school's sports festival. Overall, Seiki's team performed admirably. The first race was a running race, in which he finished third, but everyone was shocked because he was the only contestant who did not specialize in running and sprinting. Shun came up next, but his run was the polar reverse of what he had shown the public, which was feminine and small. The scavenger hunt race followed, and Ricky was the first to finish, and they each received a piece of paper. Ricky then glanced at the paper before reaching for Seiki's headpiece. Seiki fainted as he extracted the piece. The satellite energy chart became chaotic, and the prophet predicted the end of the world. When he awoke, the chart returned to a stable level, and the prophet declared everything was okay. It found out that the two buttons on his head helped him regulate his power, which he has had since he was a child and has grown stronger and stronger to the point where he can easily destroy the moon and blow up his entire house while sleeping. He will lose control of his power if they are gone. The tug of war competition follows. The abilities were so strong that they tore his gloves, forcing him to pull the opposing team up into the sky, resulting in his team's victory. The following game involves throwing bean bags into a basket. Seiki merely used his psychic abilities to catch them and hurl them into the basket of his team. His team received 83 bags, which was quadruple the number received by the other teams. But the last team received 100 bags, which surprised everyone. They had stuffed 100 bags into a larger bag and threw it in their basket. They cheated but claimed it was in good faith. Finally, there's the relay race, in which you pass the baton twice. The team's initial two members finished last since they were the class's two athletic prodigies. Ricky turned the tables by rushing swiftly with a very unusual attitude, and Kakamaran graciously congratulated herself in her mind. But before she approached Harrow, he tripped, exposing his famous backyard. One of the opposing teams tripped Harrow, causing him to tumble and display his bottom. When Seiki discovered this through his mind-reading abilities, he vowed to himself that his team would win. As he passed everyone else and neared the finish line, his body abruptly quit listening to him and he collapsed face first on the ground. Because of the commitment they made, all four boys changed their hairstyles to buzz cuts the next morning. But they quickly regretted it when they noticed the rest of the class still had their hair. They were only supposed to shave their heads if they were defeated by class 2. They lost to class 4. Today is the day when the entire class practices how to respond in the event of a fire. They all put on safety clothes and begin moving. Everyone comes in front of a closed shutter, and when they are astonished, Seiki realizes it is a test to check if they listen to the notice since there is a fire behind the shutter, so they must choose another exit. But, with ferocious resolve, everyone burst through and escaped, causing damage to the school's newly erected shutters. Someone passing by made a mistake and threw a lit match onto a stack of newspapers nearby as they were receiving reprimands from the PE teacher. With a snap of his fingers, Seiki easily put out a possible fire. Seiki goes to the grocery store to buy coffee jelly and begins debating whether is the better alternative. He was debating between 48 low-quality cups and 21 quality cups, but after seeing the premium coffee jelly cup, he purchased it right away, despite the fact that it consumed his entire monthly allowance. That's why he makes it his mission to safeguard it at all costs. While Seiki is walking home, a ball flies by, but he notices it and sends it flying. That ball belongs to Ricky and another youngster who is playing nearby, but it is the kid's grandfather's souvenir ball, so he wants to find it. When Seiki learns this, he instantly hides in the restroom using photography, only to discover that the ball is somewhere under the sea. So he gave up the 3,000 yen coffee jelly cup for that ball. As a thank you, the kid and his sister sent Seiki three premium coffee jelly cups the next morning. The next morning, everyone is talking about this one house of fortune teller as if it's a new trend. 
Shun insists he doesn't believe such lies. But after school, Seiki spots Shun standing in line at the House of Fortune Teller, mask hiding his face. After going inside with Shun and becoming invisible, Seiki discovers that the fortune teller just asserts common sense and bases her prophecies on her customer's look. It's all common knowledge, but Shun acts as though she can see right through him. Finally, Shun sees an advertisement for a friendship necklace for 30,000 yen, which he purchases. As he prepares to depart, the fortune teller tells him that a necklace can help him become friends with Seiki. After purchasing the necklace and then leaving, the fortune teller pursues him and returns the money, stating that it was all a hoax. It's unclear what Seiki did to make her act that way, but she's terrified. Seiki encounters Ricky and Shun by happenstance while going down the street. They end up eating ramen together. Kakomi happens to meet their group at the same time, so she joins them. Kakomi's attractive look draws attention, but she only pays attention to Seiki, making him understand he needs to make her lose interest. After that, Ricky brings them to a ramen restaurant. Everyone loses their appetite just looking at that shop. But when they enter, they are faced by filthy-looking tables and chairs. Worse, the owner appears to be a thug. When the food arrives, it appears to be so filthy that they may catch diseases simply by looking at it. Unexpectedly, Kakomi eats a bite to maintain her ideal image, but this causes her stomach to cramp. We are now looking at the world through the eyes of Rita, a spirit medium. Contrary to popular belief, ghosts are actually kind and helpful. As a medium, Rita can ask the spirits for as much assistance as he likes, from verifying if they do bag checks at school to determining the color of a random girl's clothes. In reality, the ghost he requested assistance from does not respond to the later section since he is so good that he does not participate in crime. A girl at school is in need of assistance because she misplaced her gym gear. When asked if he witnessed it, Rita panicked and swore it wasn't him. But, knowing that they do not suspect him, he accepts this assignment, stating, let me find the uniforms for you. A neighboring ghost claims to have seen a male student carrying a female gym bag walking in a certain direction. He dashes in that way. But when he gets to the door, the guy's spirit guardian emerges and begs him to please forgive him. Rita had met the spirit before arriving to school. Rita prioritizes justice over justice and goes inside regardless. However, by the time he gets inside, he has already escaped, and Rita is mistaken for a thief. He was convicted of a crime despite the lack of proof. Returning to Seiki, when he wakes up in the morning, he discovers that all of his psychic abilities have vanished. He can't hear people's thoughts streaming into his mind, and his punch no longer bursts through the wall. But then he hears an explosion and falls unconscious. It was all a nightmare. It turns out that his dreams are typically foreshadowings of what is to come. Therefore it is now his goal to save people before the explosion he heard occurs in reality. He saves humanity from a horrible explosion by picking up a random rock on the ground. Halting a chain of events known as the butterfly effect. If he hadn't picked up that rock, a schoolgirl wearing a miniskirt would have stumbled on it while doing a somersault kick, sending the boulder flying to a truck as the driver dropped his windows and was hit in the temporal region. If that motorist had been unconscious, he would have stepped on the throttle pedal and driven right into a petrol pump. The gasoline would have then begun to leak. Meanwhile, the female sleeping in an unsuitable position would have drawn unwanted attention from a passing male scooter rider his scooter slipping away in the leaking gas, creating an explosion. Throwing that rock aside, Seiki accidentally smacked Ricky in the head with it, leading him to believe it was a meteorite that had fallen on his head. Meanwhile, Harrow had delivered an ungodly quantity of kerosene to the instructor's room for the heater. Ricky surely showed Shun the rock, claiming it was a meteorite. But Shun obviously understood it's simply a rock, so he threw it away. But it falls inside a classroom window, near to the kerosene where Harrow had left them. A student sprints across the hallway since he is running late to be the class helper. What is unavoidable occurs. That student tripped on the rock, causing it to collide with the lead light tube, breaking it, and then colliding with the kerosene line in the corridor. The electric spark from the light tube almost struck the now leaking gas, but Seiki intervened just in time. From then on, it's evident that even the tiniest problem has the ability to escalate into a massive event, whether you want it to or not. It is up to each individual to determine whether they like dogs or cats. Although their skeletal structures appear to be similar, cats are typically more aloof and act as if they are the masters of their owners. Cats and dogs are the same to Seiki because he just sees their skeletons and muscles, but because he can read minds, he finds that cats are incompatible with him. After a bit of walking, the protagonist comes across a chubby kitten locked in a cave with many thoughts. Seiki thinks he'll just pass by, but after passing by the cat, 
He returns, then slowly leaves again, giving the cat the impression that he doesn't want to preserve such an attractive cat. Seiki turns back and asks the cat if it wants to be saved from there, but the cat remains aloof, claiming that if Seiki saves it, it will love Seiki. Cats, in its perspective, remain at the top of the pyramid while such filthy creatures as humans must love and care for them. Seiki walks away after finishing talking to the cat. However, after departing, the cat requested Seiki for assistance with a really terrible attitude, since it hasn't given up on acting like it's a noble animal. After saving the cat, Seiki walks away casually, unaware that the cat is plotting revenge on him. Seiki's father brings the exact cat home that night, intending to keep it. While it fantasizes about turning his house into its kingdom, the mother throws it out since she is allergic to cat fur. There's also Christmas. When Seiki gets home from school, he sees that all of his pals have come over and his father has dressed up as Santa Claus. Seiki's father frowned in embarrassment as he removed the fake beard and greeted Ricky, but his thug-like behavior caught him off guard. Ricky said at the dinner table that he had never received a gift from Santa Claus. When pressed, Ricky's father reveals that he died a long time ago. So the Santa suit was donned once more, but this Santa Claus gets stuck opening the door and has to enlist the assistance of his wife. Ricky, too, couldn't believe it was Santa Claus. Ricky received two gifts this year, one from Santa and one from his mother. Ricky's mother, it turns out, always places a gift near his door before he goes to sleep on Christmas Eve. He became emotional when he realized that every mother is wonderful in her own unique manner. They went to a shrine to pray. Seiki's father, being the flirt that he is, prays to his mother, stating she is his goddess, but then turns around and wishes to win 200 million yen in the lottery. They greet Shun with a trailing scarf as they prepare to return home. Ricky and Hero are also present. Then Seiki's father wishes he had a lover, which Seiki believes is impossible. But then Kakomi arrives immediately behind him. So the entire cast has arrived, and his parents have invited everyone to their home for some New Year's delicacies. After some discussion, Seiki's mother inadvertently tells his friends about his psychic abilities, which piqued everyone's interest. The parents attempted to divert the conversation, but that didn't work out in their favor, so Seiki had to go out of his way to erase the keyword psychic powers from their minds using a banana. It undoubtedly has drawbacks, because something has been removed from their memories. Individuals must fill the gaps with something generated by their subconscious brains. It turns out that Seiki's buddies now want to be even closer to him for fictitious reasons. The PE instructor at Seiki's school is notorious for his severe temperament. He is constantly taking students things since they don't pertain to their studies, therefore many students despise him. Some of them go so far as to plot an embarrassment of the teacher. They write a love letter that appears to be from a female high school student, and place it in his locker to expose his true twisted side that he hides. After reading the letter in the lavatory, the teacher decides to meet with the student to settle matters. Using his mind-reading abilities, Seiki learns about their plan, and after the teacher has waited all day for that pupil to arrive, he transforms himself into his feminine disguise and meets him. To the pupil's astonishment, the teacher is not a pervert, as he attempts to reject Seiki as gently as possible. Seiki used psychic powers to warn them because they were the ones who forced him to accept rejections from a middle-aged guy. Eventually, he broke their cover and the teacher recognized them. Feeling horrible, the kids promptly recognize their mistake and repent for what happened, learning that he is only severe because he wants the best for them. Valentine's Day is approaching and the air is thick with love, while Rita is hallucinating about how many chocolates he will receive for his perverse behavior in front of the females. Harrow doesn't need to wish for it because he is popular and kind, thus he already has a big number of thanks and friendship chocolates. Just as he believes that's it, a boy runs up to him and hands him a heart-shaped chocolate, which he interprets as a gesture of appreciation. In Shun's case, he finds a bag of chocolate under his desk. Shun initially believes it is the Dark Union attempting to capture him. When he gets a closer look, he gets butterflies in his stomach because he knows it's chocolate. Shun mistook the inscription on the cover for a present from Kakomi, but it's actually a prank by Ricky. They both had no chocolates for Valentine's Day this year. Ricky is comforting Shun about it when a girl interrupts, claiming she wants to give Shun some chocolates, making Ricky depressed. Now, he is the only one who has no secret lovers. Valentine's Day has become a nuisance for Kakomi since some moron chose to spread the information that she brought chocolate to school. All of the men at school are trying to win her over so she will give them chocolates. In reality, she brought chocolate, but it was ostensibly a thank you gift for Seiki. However, seeing all of the boys outside the female lavatory, Kakomi throws the chocolate out the window, 
not wanting a global war to break out if they discover the chocolate is for Seiki. Seiki had been standing under the window the entire time, so he caught it with ease. Today, Ricky asks Seiki to hang out from the window but receives no response since Seiki is hiding in his room, refusing to leave. After Ricky leaves, Seiki intends to resume his reading, but when Ricky's father approaches him and attempts to elicit a reaction from him, Seiki pretends not to see him. Because physical attacks are ineffective against Ricky's father, Seiki decides it would be quicker to simply teleport to another location, which he does, but Ricky's father still finds him. Clearly, teleportation is insufficient. Seiki creates an electric ball and throws it at him, but he is unmoved. Seiki, perplexed, seeks Riida's assistance, as he is Riida's guardian after all. Riida is clearly irritated that he has been interrupted mid-lewd magazine competition. But according to Seiki, no spirit medium can stop a ghost. After threatening to kill Riida, he ultimately realizes how to stop Ricky's father by enlisting the assistance of another ghost. Seiki then separates his soul from his body and sends Ricky's father flying, only to realize that Riida has tattooed dung on his physical face for a short while. Seiki's mother is a very giving woman who buys everything salespeople offer at her door, yet the hallway is often crowded with boxes of over-marketed things. Seiki's mother apologizes to him for being a fool and buying meaningless things worth up to 1 million yen. Seiki can't blame her for only wanting the best for her family. He then utilized his abilities to return all of the things and the money. Seiki's father offers to assist his wife in fending off those salesmen. But Seiki knows he won't be any different because he is easily swayed by praise. Finally, Seiki uses forced telepathy on his mother to relay the salesman's unfiltered ideas to her, causing her to chase him around the streets. Seiki discovers that his telepathy is no longer with him when he picks up a ring box that the salesperson has dropped. Further investigation reveals that the ring is composed of germanium, which disables his telepathy abilities. This brings back memories of his boyhood. When he went to the movies, spoilers always got to him through other people's ideas, rendering him unable to concentrate on the film. So, if telepathy goes away, Seiki wants to know what it's like to attend a movie in a theater. As he walks to his booth with a plate of food, Seiki runs into an unpleasant man who doesn't seem to mind that he made him drop all of his food. Seiki, who dislikes meeting Kakomi the most in this situation, ignores that impolite man and returns to his seat. It turns out Kakomi is there with someone and that someone is the actor who plays the film's protagonist. Finally, everyone recognizes him, and the show is cancelled owing to the uproar. The cat that Seiki rescued is still standing in front of his house. Seiki merely wants to pet the cat as a show of respect, but he has little interest in furry animals. His father, on the other hand, has a tremendous affection for cats, therefore he always feeds them and looks for occasions to pet and rub the cat's tail. The cat's expression is solemn as it looks out onto the street, and it turns out that another female cat is going by. While devouring the food that Seiki's father had given him, the orange cat was astonished to discover a strange man on his shoulders. Seiki turns the other cat, but because he's in animal shape and unable to control his powers, he punches his father senseless. The orange cat is terrified, yet it attempts to appear confident. Seiki intends to pair the ginger cat with the female cat of its desire after urging it to follow him to visit the female cat. They intend for Seiki to behave as a pervert to the female feline so that Ginger Cat may come to her aid. But the roles are reversed, and the female cat wishes to mate with Seiki instead. As a result, Seiki now has two cats constantly waiting at his front door, one seeking to mate with him and the other wanting to knock him out. Seiki cannot play games since his magical talents will constantly ruin the fun, so he buys a game that no one wants to play. But it turns out that the game contains every bad gaming flaw imaginable. He plays from the afternoon to the evening and completes a mission. After he fixes his broken console, the game rewinds to the first unskippable cutscene. Seiki and Ricky meet Shun's mother, who appears to be a nice and generous woman but is rigorous when it comes to studying. When Ricky asks them about their preferred university, Shun's mother makes both of them work on notebooks while she takes Shun outside to chat with him. Shun is obsessed with her son's schooling, as any mother would be. She thinks the Seiki pair is a horrible influence on him, and his poor grades have affected her. Shun disagrees and says he wants to stay friends with them, which causes Seiki to have a different opinion of someone who has the 8th grade condition. Seiki completes all of the workbooks in under 10 minutes, which dramatically transforms Shun's mother's opinion of them. They are now considered prodigies. As much as Shun appreciates his mother allowing him to have the boys around, he is deeply ashamed when his mother discovers his diary which contains information on the Dark Union. One of Riida's classmates has a crush on him, 
He knows everything about her because he is friends with her guardian, a middle-aged man. Ryuta wishes to enlist Seiki's assistance in convincing her to do anything he desires. But when Seiki declines his offer, he is determined to win her over on his own, so he accesses a womanizer spirit to assist him with flirting. Ryuta's consciousness returns just as he is about to kiss the girl, and he is smacked across the face for making such a vulgar kissing expression. Ryuta now alters her intentions by creating a harem series lead to possess him, as the man can captivate any lady he meets. Everything appears to be going swimmingly as the ghost apologizes to the girl for what happened. But just as she allows him to kiss her, he falls over a banana peel, knocking her down. Ryuta suffers another smack, and he will never be able to win over the girl of his dreams again. It's strange for Kakomi, a popular girl, to have so much on her mind when she might have anything she wants. Seiki has recently occupied her thoughts, as has Chiyo, the orange-haired girl with an ex-boyfriend full of red flags. They happen to meet on the streets and decide to hang out in a local cafe. It's an awkward situation because they don't talk much at school, but finding out they're both dreaming about the same person is lucky because they don't understand they have a crush on the same person. Seiki will have a lot of problems on his forthcoming journey now that he has two secret fans hunting him. The three-day school trip to Okinawa is approaching, and the two girls intend to travel with Seiki. They aid each other since they don't realize it's an enemy who has been by their side the entire time. As much as they want to be with Seiki, Kakomi's notoriety has brought her a lot of disadvantages because the class president decides to play it safe with the lottery due to too many boys wanting to pair up with her. Despite the fact that Kakomi and Chiyo received the first paper for Seiki's squad, Seiki want to avoid them as much as possible, so he swaps the writings, leaving the girls as side characters. Luckily for Kakomi and Chiyo, Seiki is matched with a female trio who despises Riki, so Kakomi offers to trade teams with them. She effectively kills two birds with one stone. She may now be with Seiki while seeming to everyone else as a deity who believes she sacrificed herself. But, in the end, she must form teams with another group because one of her classmates is unable to accompany them on the trip. While Seiki is having dinner with his family, Kakomi's older brother, Toru, a famous actor, rings the doorstep. He asks Seiki if he's going on a trip with his sister, and after getting permission, he tells Seiki not to hurt his beloved sister. Toru insists on accompanying Kakomi after threatening Seiki. But Seiki won't let Toru ruin everything, so he gives the ticket to the student who couldn't acquire one so that there are enough people on the plane. When we arrived at the airport, there was a storm, which delayed our flights. It shook everyone to their core. Seiki was not particularly enthusiastic about this trip, but when he realized that everyone enjoyed it, he promptly soared up to clear the storm, and the journey resumed. Shun became ill on the flight, so Seiki teleported home to buy medicine for him. Then it was the green-haired boy's time to have a stomach ache, so he turned his body back one day, only to experience the same pain the following. Continuing, it was the plane's turn to malfunction, and it was on the verge of crashing, but Seiki helped it land safely. They sat on the bus to the rest stop to eat and drink before splitting off. The females ate snacks while the boys from the Seiki group walked to the green snake store. Only dumb Shun bought the entire set to collect snakes after a succession of offers. They were divided into rooms in the afternoon, and it was time to eat at 6 p.m. It was time to bathe in the open hot spring after eating, but the lads wanted to see the girls bathing. But why were they only able to see Ricky? The boys then noticed giant Ricky and sat in a corner, feeling sorry for themselves. Kakomi and the others were ready to go to Seiki's room to play when he teleported to the beach and fell asleep. Seiki was nowhere to be found at this point, so she went to the beach to play. She then noticed Seiki lying there. She playfully ripped out one of Seiki's controls, and when Seiki awoke, the entire hotel had vanished. When Seiki approached, he took out a mound of bones in a ship's body worth the equivalent of a motel. Fortunately, he was able to return the hotel to its proper place in time. But when he learned that Kakomi was in the forest and under attack by a bear, Seiki immediately transported there to save Kakomi. The mesmerized females mistaken Ryuta for Kakomi and requested that he accompany them back to their room for a nice night's sleep. After tossing the bear aside, Seiki transported to a location that sounded rather lovely. He then transferred Ryuta to the location and mesmerized Kakomi to see Ryuta as him before falling asleep. Everyone had breakfast together the next morning as usual, and Kakomi was still thinking that Seiki had appeared in her dream the night before and was taking care of her, so she was delighted. They boarded the bus after the lunch and drove to the beach to swim. Yumi gazed at the sweet meal before jogging in the morning in order to have a slim body in time to meet Seiki. They went to the aquarium in the morning and the beach in the afternoon. The lads continued standing outside the girls' changing room for one reason. 
Kokomi in a swimsuit and her stunning appearance had everyone staring in admiration. Yume went out cautiously, but luckily, in her old-fashioned bikini, many people gazed at her because of her breasts. Yume was sitting alone under the umbrella when Shun approached to strike up a discussion. Shun's cheeks flushed a little scarlet at the time, leading her to believe that the other person was drawn to her bikini. But as Kakomi approached, he was so taken with it that he somersaulted three times. There were two males out there flirting with Kakomi at the time. Shun stood up and struck that person after Yume came out to defend Kakomi and received an abuse from those two men. They both bent their legs and ran because they didn't feel any pain. Shun is now a new person in Yume's eyes, and she is falling in love with him. The second day of the picnic had come to an end, and today was the final day, so Seiki's party began wandering around and buying groceries. Despite their disagreement, Seiki had just one goal in mind, the advertised ultra-rare and Mitsu red bean coffee. The group had to split up now. When the girl group left the cafe, it was just these two, Ricky was drawn to the blazer stand, and Shun was drawn to the vipers, so no one could stop Seiki from drinking the red bean coffee. But on the way, he met a boy with blue hair who was still suffering from stomach trouble. Next, he saw Kakomi's brother Toru, so he mesmerized a bad guy into seeing an ugly person as Kakomi, then he accidentally hugged him, and now they're blocking his path. Seiki went to a nearby snack restaurant and found his entire gang sitting there. The other five had already ordered the red bean coffee ice cream, but they blended their separate servings into one giant cup and gave it to Seiki to eat. He cracked a rare smile and began eating with everyone. The party had come to an end, and today there was a new transfer kid named Aaron at school. Everyone thought this person was amusing, but he rushed to the bathroom to vent his rage. He used to be a true delinquent since both of his parents were. He wanted to stir trouble everywhere he went, but he restrained himself. He was furious after hearing Ricky's gypsy triumphs, such as holding mosquito incense to kill a mosquito, or stealing and then biting an entire watermelon. At a wall corner, a bully robbed a student of money. With nowhere to vent his rage, Aaron snatched up the entire cabinet and threw it square in the face of the bully. He hadn't been to class in over a week, but he hadn't made any friends, so Aaron had to go and strike up a discussion. He noticed Seiki and assumed he was weak, so he approached him. But Seiki gave a terrible look prompting the boy to leave voluntarily. Shun contacted him again, and he told him all kinds of lies. He met Riita when he went out, but that was it. Then he became upset, then he unexpectedly met Kakomi. Next, he met Hero. He actively befriended Eren and stated that he had an opponent to fight, Ricky. Eren walked in to examine Ricky, hoping to see how strong he was, when he heard Ricky summoning his companion. So there's another guy who's as strong as Ricky, that guy turned out to be Seiki. When he noticed that everyone was staring at Seiki, he knew that Seiki was the boss. Ricky invited Shun and Seiki to his father's grave today. When he was about to depart, Ricky's mother arrived and encouraged them to play at their house. Seiki is still puzzled as to why Ricky's father's soul did not escape. When Ricky's father realized Seiki could see him, he begged him to assist him in confessing his affections to his mother so he could rest. So he extracted Ricky's soul to allow his father to temporarily utilize his body. And if he did not return the body within 44 seconds, Ricky would perish forever. So the father walked over there and swiftly hurried to confess to the mother. And finally he was able to speak his heart, thinking he had died. But the mother did not recognize it was her husband, making the father angry and unable to flee. Mira's coffee shop is losing clients because the coffee shop next door has recently opened. The employer is likewise in a bad mood because he barely made a living but had to pay his employees and rent for the retail premises. So Seiki and the two of them collaborated to come up with a solution. They began by changing the service outfit, and then they meticulously drew a few more advertisements and slogans for the shop. Seiki understood that given his talent, it would be easy to acquire customers, but he preferred for everything to unfold spontaneously and the shop's coffee jelly was still delicious. That's correct, and frequent customers would ultimately return. Shun recently finished seeing a detective movie, and now he wants to be a detective and investigate. There was a broken glass case at school, and Shun began investigating as well. The school also misplaced a bottle. After a while, he said that Taka was the one who stole the vase, but it was true that he was carrying a vase, so he smashed it, and Matsu advised him to go home, fix the vase, and then confessed to the principal together. Regarding the other broken glass, Seiki remembered that he had forgotten his umbrella at school the night before, so he used a tennis ball to exchange the umbrella, and he unintentionally let the tennis ball shot through the mirror, breaking it. 
It was ultimately Seiki's fault, not anyone else's. Hero, the class president, was very active and urged everyone to participate in the upcoming school festival. He proposed folding 50,000 paper cranes, 1,389 per person, in a month, which stunned the entire class. Other ideas began to emerge, and the entire class became enthusiastic, so Seiki utilized a meteorite to rush into the class, and it was at this point that Heo came up with the idea of displaying meteorites and odd stones. Reed as gang formed a band, but Reed as sang like a chicken, another guy didn't know the chords, another couldn't tell the difference between the guitar and the bass, and another only knew how to play drums in the game. As a result, Reed a wished to solicit Seiki's assistance. Seiki put on a mask and demonstrated his abilities, making all three guys gasp. After that, he taught everyone one at a time. The guy who played the piano like a dying cicada yesterday now plays very nicely. The guy who didn't know how to play any chords yesterday now plays very melodiously. The guy who didn't know anything yesterday now knows how to beat the drum to the point where his drum could drown out the cursing of the butchers in the market. Reed used to sing like a laying duck, but now he can strike high notes. Today, everyone brought out all of the weird stones to show off, and Ricky even brought a Buddha statue. Shun, Seiki, and Ricky decided to try their luck at the haunted home after viewing other classrooms. Shun was a coward with a large ego. When they uncovered a pile of costumes, the three of them dressed up to terrify others. But when Shun spotted Ricky's mother, she fainted and had to be taken out. It turns out that Ricky and Seiki's families also came to see us. Ricky snatched Seiki's glasses to play with while Seiki was in the bathroom, slightly cleaning his face, so that if Seiki looked directly at somebody, they would be horrified. When Seiki's father entered and saw the Ricky statue, he became quite delighted, and Seiki hurriedly took his spectacles to block his ability. Seiki's father was aware that this was the petrified Ricky at the time, but he inadvertently broke the statue. He contacted the police after speaking his final words to his son to confess to killing someone. It was wonderful to be self-conscious, but luckily, Seiki employed his healing talents. When Ricky's mother entered and saw the Ricky statue, she realized it was too loud. She was astonished because she assumed Seiki had made it. So the entire statue was carried to the exhibition class, and as a result, he won first place in the class with the most appealing program. The boys in the class continued to play with the statue, and a neighbor boy climbed on it and pushed it over. Luckily, Seiki was stuck on it, so the statue didn't break. The class was having a hall party that afternoon, and three fellas, Seiki, Shun, and Ricky, had not yet arrived. They became disoriented from afternoon to evening and eventually arrived at the gangster's hideaway. They apprehended Seiki and the three in the wooden house, but Seiki teleported them away, and by the time they arrived in the classroom, the class party had concluded. They should have stayed at home. Toru, Kakomi's brother, is a brother who adores his sister. He even covered his eyes and sat in his sister's room while she changed her clothing. He went to complain to Seiki that his sister no longer wanted to talk to him after that incident and requested Seiki to aid him. So the next morning Seiki went to transmit Toru's remarks to Kakomi from a distance so great that Kakomi was worried that his brother was going to disturb him again. So she apologized and sincerely offered Seiki to go out with her because she had already requested. A day out is acceptable. She assumed Seiki was glad because he could play with her that afternoon, but he just went out with her because he respected her too much. But after walking for an hour and still not finding a snack bar to visit, all the males collected and brought her and Seiki to a nearby bubble tea store. Following that, the entire party sat down to play nearby, with Seiki and Kakomi sitting at a separate table. Seiki could tell Kakomi's brother had come and was about to enter, but the gate immediately stopped him. They exchanged a brief stare before departing. Seiki and Kakomi were preparing to leave at this point. The beer was meant to cost 6,850 yen. But because Kakomi was so lovely, it was reduced to 200 yen. She had a 20 yen voucher. They kept going, but Seiki was about to go. But on the way home, Toru was already resting there, so they decided to go play at the amusement park. She expected Seiki to cave into her demands, but instead he used all of his turns to dominate each game, sending Kakomi home disappointed. Seiki was seated on a chair resting when he spotted her brother Toru was immediately behind him, and he grabbed Kakomi's hand and ran. Kakomi blushed slightly when she noticed Seiki clutching her hand. They dashed behind the curtain, using invisibility magic to hide the others from seeing them, and Kakomi reddened even more. Seiki dressed up as Santa Claus and handed gifts to youngsters during Christmas. His father was the one who would distribute gifts to children in the city, but his back pained since he carried big goods, so Seiki had to go distribute them. They wanted Santa to enter in through the chimney at the next house, 
so he complied and then transformed into a rice-powered spider web cleaner. She also chastised Santa Claus for being filthy and stated that she didn't want to touch any new gifts. After one o'clock at night, he arrived at another house and saw that there was an argument going on. The father had important work to accomplish in this household, and the mother preferred that he stay at home with her children. When the youngster asked Santa to help his parents reconcile, Seiki traveled to the company to complete all of the tasks while also leaving a gift for the boy. Seiki had already received fortunate money from both his father and mother, but he still requested a little extra from his father due to the several times he had assisted him. The Christmas event, his father being late to work, and his father spilling coffee. So, with a little money, Seiki would go out and get a new TV because the old one broke three years ago, and he always had to return it to the state it was in the day before. So now is the time for it to rest. This may have been the worst discount, therefore the employee sought to sell additional items to compensate. Finally, a coffee jelly maker with 40 batteries piqued Seiki's interest. This lured him in regardless of how powerful he thought he was. Everyone returned to school with many fresh stories, such as the cold, the hectic meals at the start of the year, and the days of going to pray and ring the bell. Weight increase during TED is probably no longer unusual to us, it's simply that I don't have the nerve to step on the scale immediately following TET. Finally, Seiki received the New Year's card on which Kakomi personally pasted the heart, but she has yet to receive a response. She assumed Seiki was probably practicing writing a lot in order to surprise her, and Seiki said, What the hell? I never practiced. Shun wanted to ask for money when he noticed two gangsters blocking Aaron's way to school this morning. Shun observed this and intended to rush to call for help, but when he turned around, he saw Aaron beating those two guys and strangling another guy. Shun was terrified of Aaron and was still unsure whether he was a genuine mobster or not. Aaron exhibited a massive figure while changing into workout gear, which made Shun nervous. Baseball was the day's gym lesson and a ball was launched directly against Aaron's head, leading Shun to believe there would be a large brawl, but Aaron proceeded to play normally, and luckily it was pouring, so no one got wounded. Shun accompanied Seiki when four criminals stopped him on the way back. At this point, the four rushed to vanquish Shun but were unsuccessful. Even the boss, who was about to defeat Seiki, had his stick broken by Shun, but it was all a dream. If the dude took the iron stick and bashed it into the wall, Shun would collapse and swiftly hand over the wallet. Shun pushed the other person away and instructed Seiki to flee while they were stealing Seiki's money. At the same time, Aaron passed by, and Shun called for Aaron to run with him. This is nothing to a true mobster. As a result, Aaron knocked them out one by one in an instant. On the drive home, Shun informed Aaron that the past doesn't matter and that they should try together. They exchanged handshakes, but Shun was so frail that even a light squeeze ached. Three gentlemen were heading out to eat ramen noodles today, but the business owner was sick. Ricky wanted to play games, but Shun preferred to eat out. The two men then argued and decided to go to the game. They both chose air hockey, with the winner being the first to nine points. Despite Shun using two pucks, Ricky scored the first goal of the game. Shun the mischievous crouched down, told Ricky to find his possessions, and then attacked him unexpectedly. After then, thanks to dirty techniques, both teams had an equal score of eight, but Shun, who played so unsportsmanlikely, nevertheless won the game. Ricky was working at a new grocery store. Seiki, Shun, and Aaron went in to see how he was doing with his sales. Customers who came to buy goods, strangely, did not utilize the vending machine and instead assessed the price themselves. Ricky was the one who broke the vending machine. Later, the owner came out and stated that he could only be like this because of Ricky because he had a heart attack last week, and he informed Ricky that he could sell goods himself from now on. So Ricky kept looking for work at the ramen shop, but he still spilled people's dishes, so the three guys invited each other to work as bartenders, and Seiki transformed Ricky into a different shape because no one would hire the old face. However, he continued to throw water on the customers' heads, and the other guests cursed loudly, causing Aaron to become enraged and punch them. How is it possible to work like this? Today is the big day for the 10-kilometer run. Harrow took the lead at the start of the race. Ricky caught up with him after he bought water, leading Harrow to cry out and accelerate up. A group of males here invited each other to take a taxi. Shun and a few other boys were too exhausted to run, so Seiki cleansed their fatigue to assist them in recovering and continuing to run. Ricky ran backwards and still outran Harrow, so Harrow played dirty by saying there was a new ramen restaurant opening which distracted Ricky and allowed Harrow to cross the finish line first. The others returned as well, and Seiki returned on turn 44, while the girl group would run another day. 
Kakomi bought a cake today in order to play at Seiki's place. However, the neighbor boy was present as well. Seiki's mother greeted Kakomi cordially, and when she opened the box, there was also a heart-shaped cake. It's a bakery gift, and Seiki's mother thought Kakomi bought it for her kid to eat, and Kakomi also wanted Seiki to eat it first. But the other boy ate it first, breaking Kakomi's request. Kakomi didn't have time to talk to Seiki alone after eating the cake because the three of them went out to see Superman. She walked away, but the neighbor boy stared at her like the villain in a superhero movie, ready to harm her. Yes, that is very sad. Seiki's father has grown up but is still interested about creating superheroes, and when showing Seiki the model kit, the cat ran over and smashed it. But he had to let it go because he likes cats, and Seiki eventually agreed to pick up the cat and carry it out. And then this damned cat choked on a chunk, there was no other option, so Seiki had to grow small enough to enter the animal's throat and remove it. At this moment, Seiki has to keep his small shape for an hour, so the father tries to bully him. But no, Seiki helps him create 720 Tidig 2. Seiki also picked up a 500 yen coin. But then cockroaches started running out, so Seiki summoned the robot to combat the cockroach. But the cat appeared and patted the cockroach to death. So Seiki began petting this cat from then on. Kongu is a delinquent third-year student who wanted to abuse Seiki but then phoned Mr. Matsu will come to our aid. The teacher informed Seiki that this was his former pupil, and that he want for him to graduate, so Seiki decided to assist him in changing. He continued to abuse the students on the street, but Seiki telepathically changed his mind and proceeded to the barber shop. When Seiki put him to sleep, he awoke with a crew cut. When he arrived at school, he proudly displayed his spiky hair to Mr. Matsu, but the teacher exhibited no emotion which made Kongu upset. Seiki was going to be hit, but he sent a message to his brain that when he made a mistake, Matsu was the one who apologized. When the teacher noticed the new haircut, he became emotional but tried to contain it. Kongu planned to change and put on spectacles after hearing this, but Mr. Matsu stated that you would have to retake a year because you took too much leave. If that's the case, then why the heck should you study? Today, the entire class went to sing karaoke, and Seiki was only concerned with the fruit ice cream cup. Everyone sang together for a time after Seiki ordered the ice cream cup, and then the ice cream cup was given to someone else. Ricky requested Seiki to sing with him, but Seiki had already gone to the bathroom, and when he returned, the room was very silent. It turns out that everyone was sweating because of Ricky's singing. Everyone continued begging Seiki to sing, but when Seiki handed the microphone to Ricky and requested a duet, everyone fled. Today, the Seiki family visited Seiki's outhouse in the isolated countryside. Grandmother greeted the family cheerfully, while grandfather had a frown on his face. It was just the expression on his face, but the grandfather was as thrilled as a child for his daughter to see him in his room. But after learning that they would return the next day, his countenance grew gray, so he walked out to grab a newspaper to inform them that they might stay for two days and three nights, and he was finally given his request. He was overjoyed when he learned that his grandson Seiki would bring tea and cakes, but when he began to get serious, he saw his son-in-law come in, so he became enraged and chased Seiki's father out. While he was angry, his nephew brought in the food, and just as he was ready to speak, the nephew left, but because Seiki loved him, he brought another part for grandpa to eat. That night, they lay close and muttered something, but it was only a dream. Another day, the entire family went to the amusement park, which was in disarray when they arrived. The roller coaster even had screws fall out, so everyone went home. However, because the father indulged his wife, the three Seiki family members rode a roller coaster, nearly killing the father, and his mother had to pull him in. Seiki and his grandfather were on the Ferris wheel, but it ended in disaster. The Ferris wheel broke down while I was seated with Seiki. Despite his fear, he held Seiki and sought to protect him, which caused Seiki to have a different opinion of him, and thus the two husbands on both sides of the bench lay nervous. Seiki's family had to go home this morning, but grandfather didn't want them to go, so he took out the tank and faked the car was out of gas. But Seiki was aware that the gasoline was in the trunk. Going a bit further, they came across a landslide, as if the gods were blessing their grandfather to achieve what he desired. But Seiki's parents informed him that Seiki has abilities, and so their family returned home. The grandparents stood there, looking back, reminiscing. Seiki purchased a new game today, and he wore a ring to prevent his ability to read his opponent's mind and play the game better. The majority of the circumstances in the game revolve around Seiki's daily life, which entails him hiding from his pals in order to go home as soon as possible. In general, it's a typical, passable game. 
Rita got immensely popular among girls after being the victim of a musical ghost following her terrible performance. And at the time, there was a person who mistreated his lover, thus Rita nearly defeated him thanks to the ghost of a kung fu teacher. So the girls at school began falling in love with Rita and seeing movies with him. But while going down the street, the singer's ghost and the kung fu ghost took turns trying to enter Rita's body, and eventually, no girls followed him. Today is the first day of operation for the clubs. Rita formed his own mystical club in order to establish his own harem, and when he entered the club room, he observed a long-haired female. It turned out that the female student who wanted to join the club was unsightly without her bangs. Shun and Yum then joined because Shun is crazy and Yum is in love with Shun. Shun, on the other hand, thought he liked the new female but he hadn't yet seen her face. Seiki, Haro, and Shun were on the same team for today's culinary class. Their initial results were abysmal, but Mira was so hungry that she ate them. Shun resumed cooking, but this time he threw the egg directly at Mr. Matsu's head, therefore he received a reprimand. Haro tried as well, but another dish was sent to the motherland. Mira did not criticize and even drank the batter. Kakomi has her own crazed fan base, but because she is so close to Seiki, that crazed fan base kidnaps Seiki to question him, and they incorrectly believe the neighbor boy is his and Kakomi's illegitimate child. But when they saw Kakomi so happy with Seiki, they recognized that her happiness was what they wanted to safeguard, and they all went without untying him. Today, when Seiki was walking home from school, a baseball was thrown at him, and his power control gadget was damaged, so he needed to patch it immediately or it would be deadly, because a single touch can cause a person to fly away. He leaned on the wall and knocked it down, so he had to rebuild it. He met Ricky at his house, so he had to distract him, and then he teleported home and requested his smart brother to help him fix it, so his parents pushed Seiki's wheelchair to Seiki's brother. He recalled that when his brother was born 18 years ago, he could pronounce his first sentence at one month old, so at two years old, he could study like an eight-year-old, and his IQ was 218. He was dubbed a genius, but when he was three years old, he encountered a major impediment, Seiki, with his superpower. So, when he was 14, his brother left and didn't see him for four years. The father realized at this point that he had forgotten where he had placed the bag containing the bits to assemble the controller. But owing to camera technology, Seiki's brother was able to swiftly discover it, finish assembling the controller, and give it to Seiki to wear. However, after wearing it, Seiki was unable to read his brother's thoughts. The apparatus on his skull, it turned out, was blocking Seiki's telepathy. Seiki's brother could already ride a motorcycle when he first learned how to ride a bike. If the brother received just a few hundred points, he would receive 9 million points. As a result, he had to travel abroad. Two players played rock, paper, scissors, and when they returned to the hotel, Seiki noticed Shun and Ricky were also present. His brother had invited them to play catch around London at the time, and he reasoned that by inviting the other two, Seiki would have to limit his use of his skills. If Seiki won, his brother would arrive this afternoon with a cake feast. When they heard the bet, they went over to tell Shun and Ricky that they were going to play hide and seek. While he socked, Seiki and the two of them hid. The kids had 30 minutes to hide anywhere they wished, and as they were hunting for a hiding spot, Seiki noticed his older brother parachute in. Before Shun fainted, the three of them got their bicycles and ran for a time before the brother drove his motorcycle down from the skies. They curled their buttocks and kicked each other. They dashed into the shopping area after discovering my control device has a locator, and their brother proclaimed it over the loudspeaker, generating a commotion. They had to flee to the bathroom. When the brother thought he'd won, he opened the door to find out it wasn't Seiki. Seiki had mesmerized the individuals in the room and had escaped upstairs. Seiki triumphed once more. They all went to the gallery today to look at the images. Shun evaluated the artwork like a high school literature instructor. The following room was filled with infantile decorations. Ricky drew a painting in three seconds, but the vice president of the museum came out and wanted to display it. Shun also drew a painting, which was flatly rejected. When Shun returned home, the director came over and saw Shun's painting, which he praised for its beauty. How is this even appealing? Everyone encouraged Seiki to engage in events as they prepared for the forthcoming summer vacation, but he declined them all. While stepping out the door, he noticed Kakomi had a pair of tickets to the amusement park and wanted to invite him to go, so he leaped out the window to hide, but the pair of tickets somehow flew out the window, enabling Kakomi to discover Seiki. So he had to gather a throng to make Kakomi feel uncomfortable and force him to leave. Then, in order to avoid being revealed, he accepted Rita's invitation, and from then on, more people began scheduling, until the summer calendar was totally booked. He was so enraged that he pinched Rita's face, 
causing her entire facial structure to deform. They went to Rita's place to camp together, and the two were looking for the person they liked but didn't know how to pair up, so they had to draw a group, and Yoon was in the same one as Rita. They appeared to get along well, and Rita was also quite gallant, giving Yoon a really loving sensation until he met the wild boar and abandoned her. Yoon's feelings for Rita vanished as well. The tennis training camp came next. Harrow and Ricky were present. Ricky defeated the newly arrived coach. He sensed his potential and asked Harrow to confront Ricky. The tennis match began, with Ricky and Seiki on one side and Harrow and another friend on the other. At first, there were only these two monsters, so Seiki directed the ball to another location to demonstrate that he couldn't join the club. But because it flew too far, he was welcomed. They would subsequently be asked to participate in Yoon's research and swallow a weird drug. Yoon's heart vanished on the second day and Ricky's right hand grew extraordinarily huge. Don't ask me what he did. The youngsters got fat and thin on the third day, and giants on the fourth day. Seiki heals them consistently, and on the day of the test, Seiki altered their pill. But they still turned too young or too old, and finally transformed into two muscular people. When the scientists noticed this, they assumed it was the result of a mushroom effect. Seiki remembered the other two eating the mushroom at this moment. Shun and Aaron took their driver's license tests the next week. The theory exam came first. Aaron, on the other hand, only knew how to utilize the signs to fight people. So the teacher gave them a plethora of theoretical books, and they quickly passed thanks to his hard work. Seiki had intended to go out with Kakomi on the last day of her summer vacation. But when she saw Seiki carrying the other youngster from the neighborhood, she decided to let him go to the lost babysitting location. And, based on the boy's preferences, the three of them went to see the superhero show. When Kakomi was preparing to take advantage of the boy watching this show to bring Seiki out alone, the person who played the yaokai ran down and grabbed Kakomi up to act with her, and her sweetness drew all eyes. As a result, the crowd requested that the superhero defeat the monster. Siderman continued to kick the monster, and just as he was ready to finish, Kakomi exclaimed, Let's win, Minoru. Minoru is not only Siderman's name but also the name of the person playing the monster. Hence the monster defeats Siderman with a single kick. As a result, Seiki had to act as the second Siderman. There is a highly wealthy Seiko firm, and today the chairman's son moved school to PK Academy to prepare for college. He had observed Kakomi and had decided to come here to ask her out. Seiko had rice, water, lobster, carrots, and various other foods brought out to him for lunch. He also spent his family's money to gain access to Kakomi's fan club. At the time, Kakomi was hiding in the toilet. She reviewed her profile and saw that Seiko's family is quite wealthy, but she still adores Seiki. Seiko walks in and asks Kakomi to be her girlfriend, but Kakomi refuses because she is in love. It's Seiki calling. Seiko pretended not to be spicy when Seiki entered, but he was actually irritated. So he transferred Seiki's father's work to Siberia, where it was all snow and even accused Kakomi's brother of having a connection with a 42-year-old lady. That night, he was sitting on the throne of money when Kakomi's fan team arrived to exact retribution for upsetting Kakomi. Seiko was terrified when Seiki appeared in his room. Seiko promised to give him all of the money if he departed. However, Seiki tossed all of the money away, but only Seiko's bodyguards wanted them because Kakomi's admirers still wanted to assassinate Seiko. Seiki returned the money and directly smashed Seiko. Seiki brought his grandparents here the next day, when the father was about to have a good time with the mother, so there was another day of trouble with the father. They were planning to invite each other out, but Grandpa kept begging Seiki's father to stay at home alone so he could experience the feeling with the rest of the family. But, knowing that Grandpa was too much for them, they ignored him and went shopping. Ricky came over to Grandpa who was sitting on a stone bench and believed there was a conflict. But the two got along quite well, and went shopping together. He gave Seiki new glasses that night, but Seiki switched bodies with his father. He didn't want to give it to his father, but seeing Seiki's parents and wife happy made him happy as well. Shun called the men to his house for a Halloween party today, but when Seiki came, Shun noticed that he was still dressed properly and encouraged him to come in so he could dress up. Haro and Aaron realized they needed to dress up for the Halloween party, so one of them draped a blanket around his body while the other tied bandages around his. Then there's Ricky, who doesn't even wear makeup but everyone thinks he's a great monster. Shun thus mopes around with the three boys while they enjoy having sewage splashed in their faces. Shun then came in, afraid of Seiki. Seiko decided to act because he felt so humiliated. He asked Ricky to enjoy grilled meat and crayfish when he went to meet Seiki's group. Then he spent 150 million yen to hire Ricky as his henchman. 
but Ricky continued to show no signs of agreement, until he abruptly stated that he would accept this luggage, leading Seiko to believe that all could be addressed with money. Ricky, on the other hand, emptied out all the money, threw the luggage to a drowning boy below, and went down to save him. Seiko knew at this point that money could not solve everything. Yume grew into a pig overnight without notice. Yume realized this and decided to go for a run in the afternoon. But after a short run, she brought out a variety of food to consume to replenish her energy. But then she realized these things were only agreeable to her palate, and she was looking worse and worse. Seiki snatched the last of Yume's food when she crunched on the grass. Yume imagined Shun was watching her workout, and she was back in form and a little smaller than before a few days later. Even though recess had only begun 10 minutes before, this person requested Seiki to do homework with him. Another guy wanted him to play soccer. Yet another guy urged him to punch each other, and yet another dude was watching his sister at the school gate. In general, there are no ordinary characters in this series. They all unexpectedly returned home before Seiki, but when they observed Seiki's departure, they called an emergency meeting. But Seiki also transported to a hidden window and listened in. Everyone wants to throw a surprise birthday party for Seiki, but his birthday is three months away, and tomorrow is Seiki's father's birthday. They discussed all of their intentions to organize, but Seiki dismissed them all. Seiki was scheduled to be on duty the next day, but he got away with it, and the group was astonished, believing they had to cancel the party. They all made their way over to Seiki's house and rang the doorbell. When Seiki reappeared, they were celebrating his birthday, which made him very pleased, but it was actually his father, and Seiki had charmed the others. Father Seiki informed everyone that his mother was living alone, and that his father had died while they were sitting and conversing. So they assumed Seiki's father was dead, shocking him and explaining it was all a hoax. Then Harrow and Aaron chastised him. The cake was next, although I don't think it'll taste very nice. So Seiki reverted to its original form, and people began eating and conversing in earnest. Seiki's dad exited the gathering and approached him, telling him that they were extremely good friends. Seiki went down and enjoyed the party after hearing that. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.